Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining me. This is The Wealthy Warlock and we're going to run through today a little bit of an audio book. Um, something that is just added to the cloud, so to speak, or from the Google project. Fortunately, something that they're doing for us all is they're <clears throat> scanning and releasing things to the public via the internet uh, that hit the 100 year mark. For those that don't know, once something hit, once something in literature hits the 100 year mark, the copyright laws change for that item and it becomes public domain. So these are usually private um, contents. This book is usually something you would have to pay for, but is now held under public domain. And as such, we're freely able to disseminate this information. Now, of course, I'm not a practicing law consultant. I'm not here to give you any legal information. This is a disclaimer just to say that I'm here just reading this as verbatim as I can for you um, here on YouTube. If you need legal advice, I suggest you seek legal advice where you need it. And uh, yeah, this is solely for educational and for <laughs> entertainment purposes because, you know, I make myself laugh and that's important. So <clears throat> this particular book we're going through today is called Business Trusts as Substitutes for Business Corporations from 1920. Um, the author is Guy A. Thompson. G Y um, Thompson with an H, T H. You'll see as we go through the book. Um, I'll provide a link to the material that is available uh, in the public domain um, in the comments for YouTube once it's up and running there. Or well, hunky dory. All right, getting into it. It's just the cover page from Google stating as I did before. Um, this one is from Stanford University Library. So we've got all the direct scans from there. Business trusts as substitutes for business corporations. A paper read before the Kansas City Bar Association. April 10th, 1920, by Guy A. Thompson, Esquire of St. Louis Bar. Again, from the Stanford Library. This is really good. Preface, something more than a year ago, it became necessary for me in the discharge of my professional duties to consider the proposed employment of the Express Trust as a vehicle of trade. Interest thus aroused has since led me to read as widely on the subject as opportunity permitted. I learned that the attention of lawyers generally was being directed to this subject. Accordingly, when recently I accepted an invitation to address the Bar Association of Kansas City, no subject seemed to be more opportune for discussion, certainly none appropriate for such an occasion, <clears throat> in which I personally felt a keener interest. The subjoined production was the result. There was no thought of publication in, in its preparation, but merely within the necessarily restricted limits of such a paper to select for discussion those phases of the subject which seemed both interesting and fundamental. Since its, its delivery, members of the bar whose judgment I value have advised that it be published, and so numerous are the requests received for copies that I have consented to its publication. I have done this with some hesitation for it is not and in the nature of things could not have been a comprehensive treatise. On the contrary, many of the important aspects of the subject were of necessary necessity eliminated from consideration, such for example, as the duties of the trustees, their right of indemnity, their liability to the sestis, action by and against the trustees' theory and extent of creditors' rights against the trustees and against the trust estate, inviolability of the trust fund, seeking direction of the chancellor, etc. With this forward of explanation, I submit the pages that follow in the hope that they may be of interest and possibly of service to my brethren of the bar. 
Thanks, Guy. It's now going to go in service to the greater whole of humanity. Let's do it. Do it. All right. Now, index. <clears throat> the Business Corporation. Section one, it's rapid growth. The most remarkable fact of all commercial history is the business corporation. Remarkable not only because of the economic and social part it has played, but remarkable also because of the rapidity and magnitude of its growth. With approximate accuracy, it may be said that the business corporation is the product of the past 70 years. As late as 1775, so eminent an authority as Adam Smith wrote, the only trades which it seems possible for a joint stock company to carry on successfully without an exclusive privilege are those of which all the operations are capable of being reduced to what is called a routine or to such a uniformity of method as admits of little or no variation. Of this kind is first the banking trade, Secondly, the trade of insurance from fire, from sea risk and capture in time of war. Thirdly, the trade of making and maintaining a navigable cut or canal. And fourthly, the similar trade of bringing water for the supply of a great city. <clears throat> there is authoritative warrant for the statement that up to the year 1800, there were not to ex exceed 100 private corporations in the entire United States that one half of these were in Massachusetts and that the enterprises carried on by them were banking, turnpike roads, toll bridges, canals, and to a very limited extent, manufacturing. Giving attention to our own state of Missouri, it may be noted that during our territorial days, but two private corporations were created and both of those were banks, namely, the Bank of St. Louis in 1813 and the Bank of Missouri in 1817. From Missouri's admission to the Sisterhood of States in 1821 to the year 1850, while a number of academics, colleges, seminaries, turnpike road insurance and railroad companies, and a few bridge and bank companies were incorporated, yet it is unlikely that more than 50 companies were granted charters which now would incorporate under the Manufacturing and Business Act. The first English text upon corporations, KYD, was published in 1790, sorry, 1793 and dealt exclusively with municipal corporations. The first American text, that of Angel and Ames, appeared, or Ames, in 1831 and gave scant treatment to business corporations. Indeed, it may be said that a corporate literature and the business corporation as it exists today virtually began with the year 1850. And yet in 1918, there were in the United States at least 350,000 business corporations with gross incomes of upwards of 79 and a half trillion net income of 10 and a half trillion paying to the federal government alone in income taxes for the year 1917, $2.142 trillion. Now, section two, reasons for delay in development. Without doubt, their growth was retarded until this late date, first because of the difficulty and expense attendant upon the securing of corporate charters, and secondly, because of the necessities of commerce, was served with measurable adequacy by the ordinary partnership and quasi-partnership, the joint stock company. In England, only the Crown and Parliament could grant corporate charters, and not until 1862 was the English Companies Act adopted. Called by Sir Francis Palmer, the Magna Charter of Cooperative Enterprises. In our country, it, it, it was... Sorry, in our country, it was necessary to obtain corporate charters by special acts of legisl legislatures, excepting perhaps a half a dozen states. We find no general incorporation acts till toward the middle of the last century. In Missouri, the first general corporation act for business companies was enacted in 1849, and not until 1865 was the creation of corporations by special acts 
of the leg legislatures prohibited by constitutional provision. During the early part of the last century, the field of commercial enterprise was held by the ordinary partnership practically alone. But the increase in population, the constantly growing settlements by the pioneers of new territory, the discovery of vast natural resources, the multiplication and complexity of human needs and wants, the progress of inventions, and particularly the advent of steam, proved that the partnership was an agency utterly inadequate to commercial necessities. It was inadequate chiefly because of the unlimited liability of its members, but this made it impossible to mobilize necessary capital. The result was that corporations began to increase, and when the restraint was uh, sorry, when the restraint that was imposed upon their formation was removed by the enactment of general corporation acts, under which they might be readily organized at little expense, they quickly crowded the partnership from the field and started upon that curve. Sorry, and started upon that career, which is the outstanding feature of commercial history. Section three, accomplishments. Neither has the rapidity of their growth exceeded the importance of their accomplishments, for without forgetting or in any degree minimizing or palli palliating the gross frauds, the heavy oppressions, and the black inequities that have been and are today being perpetrated under the corporate cloak. It must be conceded by all that the business corporation has been also of immeasurable benefit to mankind. It has played an important, if not an indispensable part in the development and progress of our country and the world. It has afforded the means for experiments essential to the development of our arts and sciences. It has fostered our industries, cultivated our deserts, bought from their hiding places, the stored up treasures of nature, harnessed the very elements to service of mankind, bridged our rivers, tunneled our mountains, constructed our railroads, and while linking our states in closer unity, has brought the nations of the earth together. <laughs> yeah. Section four, reasons. Without doubt, this monopolization by the corporation of the field of commercial endeavor has been due to the limited liability of the investor or stockholder, for it was this assurance that made it possible to mobilize capital in projected business enterprises. In this connection, it is interesting to recall that we have come far away from the original conception of the chief value of the corporation. Since the municipal, the ecclesiastical, the educational, and the charitable corporation preceded the regulated company and the joint stock company, its immortality was emphasized as the chief and most valuable attribute of corporate existence. Indeed, as late as 1819, it would seem to be this characteristic that was chiefly emphasized by our great chief justice in his famous definition of in the Dartmouth College case. With the advent of private corporations, it was the right of association, governmental powers, and trading privileges that were chiefly desired and that were granted. Though early decided, though early decided that the stockholder was not personally liable for the debts of the corporation, Yet the corporation, through alleviations, could compel him to pay the sums assessed. Later, this power was avoided by contract between the stockholder and company. But until and unless it was so avoided, the creditor might enforce it in chancery through a kind of subrogation. The artificial personality gradually came to be emphasized, and from that fiction was developed what proved to be the attribute of chief value, namely the limited liability of the stockholder. For the theory is that since the corporation is an artificial person entirely distinct from those who have formed it, its debts and obligations are those of this artificial person and not of its stockholders. Section five, growing dissatisfaction. And yet through its growth has been, though its growth has been marvelous and its accomplishments great, 
is there not now perceptible and increasing dissatisfaction with the corporation as a business agency? Can it be that the very fiction, viz, impersonal, artificial entity distinct from the persons composing it, which has given such value to the corporate form, is now being laid hold of to cripple its usefulness? Why are businessmen in increasing numbers asking for another device? some other vehicle or agency of trade that will serve the needs of commerce and be free from oppressive exactions. Section six, six disadvantages. That there are corporate disadvantages must be conceded. Prejudice is one of them. It is reflected daily in our courts in the, ver in the verdicts of juries while our legislatures too frequently respond to it. Again, the corporation being an artificial person existing only in contemplation of law and by force of law can have no legal existence beyond the boundaries of the sovereignty which created it. It must dwell in the place of its creation and cannot migrate to another sovereignty. It is not a citizen with the meaning within the meaning of Articles 4, Section 2 of the Constitution of the United States, providing that the citizens of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states. It follows that it may do business in any other state only by comity, and that the other state may prescribe such conditions as it will, not discriminatory, upon the right of the for foreign corporation to transact business within its borders. The consequent cost and inconvenience are uh, harassing and burdensome to the corporation that transacts business in several states. Constantly changing legislation and the necessarily attendant uncertainty are additional impediments, but there is no assurance whatever that the law of today with respect of corporate rights will remain as a law of tomorrow. Inquisitorial legislation and the state's visitorial powers finding expression in the necessity of making multitudinous reports and of submitting to examinations by state authorities also disagreeable features of corporate's existence. <laughs> Above all, perhaps taxation presents the most formidable objection to corporate life, for it seems that we have entered upon a new economic era in which revenue in large part is to be collected from the public indirectly through corporate levies. Section 7. Is there a substitute? Is there any arrangement men may make, any form of agreement they may enter into under which they may serve the requirements of commerce and trade as satisfactorily does the corporation? The ordinary partnership will not answer. Its necessarily limited resources and the unlimited liability of its members have already proven this. The limited partnership is no more satisfactory since it is rendered impracticable by statutory requirements. Neither will we find our answer in the quasi-partnership, the joint stock company, for while it affords advantages not found in the ordinary partnership, it still contains the very element of the ordinary partnership that causes its rejection, namely the unlimited liability of its stockholders. The vehicle for which we seek, therefore, must, as its essential characteristic, afford limited liability to the investor, for unless it is possible for men to contribute to a business enterprise without thereby endangering their entire private fortunes, it will be futile to attempt the mobilization of capital in amounts sufficient to transact any considerable part of the business of the country. The Business Trust. Enter the Business Trust. Section 8, Origin and Development. Whether derived from the Roman Fide Commissa, or as Mr. Justice Holmes concludes from the German law, all students of the law will agree with Professor Maitland that of all the exploits of equity, the largest and most important is the invention and development of the trust. It is an institute of great elasticity and generality, as elastic as general contract. 
a remarkable tribute this to an institution the parents of which were fraud and fear and whose nurse was a court of conscience for it should be remembered that in its youthful days the trust or use if not devised was still employed by the debtor to avoid his creditor by the freeholder to be relieved from the feudal burdens he owed his lord and by the ecclesiastic to avoid the mortmain statutes it was also laid hold of, of during the years of sorry it was also laid hold of during the wars of york and lancaster to prevent forfeitures of estates for treason later the increase in property the multiplication of investments and the increasing complexity of in financial affairs it reached its maturity and was used in the making of marriage and family settlements and settlements upon charities it is of the express trust so employed we are accustomed to think and with which we are most familiar section nine the proposed business trust now it is urged by members of our profession who to a serious consideration of the subject have brought wide research and a wealth of learning that this institute of great elasticity and generality as elastic as general contract may be utilized in the field of commerce as and trade as an effective substitute for the ordinary private business corporation its use as they suggest closely resembles in form the incorporated company it is created by the ex execution of a declaration of trust usually by three or more trustees to whom there has been or will presently be transferred or paid the property or money to constitute the corpus of the trust it recites one the property that constitute the corpus of the trust and that the corpus shall be by the trustees managed and disposed of for the benefit of the holder from time to time of the transferable certificates of shares or of beneficial interest issued and to be issued by the trustee thereunder. Two, if desired, the number of shares or of beneficial interests that may be issued their character, whether common or preferred or both but both may be issued, and the nominal of par value if they are to have an expressed par value. Number three, the business to be conducted by the trustees and an elaborate presentation of the powers they may exercise in its prosecution and in the management of the corpus. Four, usually a clause providing that creditors shall look only to the funds and property of the trust for payment and requiring the trustees to incorporate in their legal contracts a provision to this effect. Five, that the shareholders shall have no title to the trust property, but only the right at the termination of the trust to share pro rata in the proceeds of the sale of the property thereof, and meanwhile to income uh, which shall be distributed when and provided therein, and that the death of the shareholder shall not operate to terminate the trust or entitle his legal representative to an accounting. Six, generally a name and a provision for the adoption of a seal. Seven, the trustees' compensation and the manner and time of choosing trustees and filling vacancies. Eight, the extreme limit of time during which the trust may continue, usually not more than 21 years after the death of the last surviving original trustee. Such other provisions as appear appropriate and desirable may, of course, be added. Thus, the corpus of the trust corresponds to the capital of the incorporated company, the trustees of the board of directors, the beneficiaries, or sestike trust, to the stockholders and the beneficial interests or shares to the corporation's shares of stock. Mm. Very interesting. Section 10. It's legality considered. We propose to consider this proposal solely from the standpoint of the investor. The comparative novelty of this employment of the express trust at once excites inquiry as to its legality 
Equity has long since established the principle that all persons sui juris have the same power to create trusts that they have to make the disposition of their property, that everyone competent to enter into a contract or to make a will or to deal with the legal title to property may make such disposition of it as he pleases, and he may annex such conditions and limitations to the enjoyment of it as he sees fit, and he may vest it in trustees for the purpose of carrying out his intention, or, as said by Lewin, it may be laid down as a general rule that whoever is competent to deal with the legal estate may, if he so disposes, vested in a trustee for the purpose of executing the settler's intentions. While not customary, it has not been unusual for the testator in his will to designate that a trustee therein appointed shall, for a limited time, carry on the business of a partnership of which testator was a member, and it must be considered that no legal objection has been found to this use of the trust. Again, since the settler may convey property to a trustee in trust for himself and others, there would seem to be no legal objection to the business trust upon the ground that the beneficiaries thereof are themselves the settlers. It has been judicially determined by two notable decisions, one in England and one in North Dakota, that a business trust created by a debtor with himself as his creditors as sister key trust is a valid arrangement which equity will recognize and enforce. Rewind that if you need to listen to it again. As long as go as as long ago as 1880, in Smith v. Anderson, which is without doubt the leading English case upon this subject, the Court of Chancery gave judicial recognition and approval to a trust of the character we are now discussing. For at least the past 35 years in the state of Massachusetts, the business trust has been a recognized institution of great utility. In at least three decisions, by the Supreme Court of the United States presently to be noticed, it has received judicial recognition. Likewise, in other cases here and there, only a few, it is true, the courts have approved them. Therefore, it may be fairly concluded that weapons of attack have not as yet been used to destroy the legality of the business trust. However, every invitation Sorry, every innovation to serve commercial needs has met with opposition. Indeed, this was true of the corporation, and it is reasonable to assume that the express trust as an agency of trade, if it shall be increasingly used, will be subjected to the closest legal scrutiny, and that objections to it are not yet considered will be found. Recently, the Attorney General in the state of Ohio answering an inquiry from the Commissioner of Securities as to whether a trust seemingly of the character we are considering was valid, rendered an opinion holding that it was not, because in his judgment it had the appearance of a corporation. Its mode of conducting business was such as was calculated to impress the general public with the belief that it was a corporation, and its acts and mode of organization and control was such as appertained to corporations, all were done after the manner of corporations. Therefore, he held, it was volative, violative of the state of Ohio author authorizing an action in quo warranto to be brought against an association of persons who act as a corporation within this state without being legally incorporated. This suggests first whether the state may, by constitutional statutory provision, forbid this proposed use of the trust, and second, the further inquiry whether, in the absence of statute, quo warranto, would lie for assuming and us or usurping of privileges of the franchise of an incorporation.